This e-lecture will focus on chronic weight loss in the horse. What do I need to consider? Firstly, is there definitely weight loss? Secondly, what are the most likely differential diagnoses? Thirdly, which further diagnostic tests are best? Next, what treatment options should I consider? How should I monitor response to treatment? And finally, what sort of prognosis should I give the owner? In order to address these questions, we will look at a typical clinical case, look at the possible differential diagnoses, look at typical clinical signs, look at treatment and prognosis for different diagnoses, and finally look at a summary. So this is Spider, a two-year-old warm blood colt, who presents with a weight loss of two weeks duration. He is bright and alert, and has a good appetite, but also has ventral edema. This has persisted despite adequate nutrition and treatment with moxidectin. So what are the differential diagnoses for chronic weight loss in the horse? Common differentials include inadequate nutrition, dental disease, Sathostomiasis, particularly in autumn and spring, liver disease, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, and neoplasia, such as alimentary lymphosarcoma. Less common differentials include peritonitis, chronic equine grass sickness, and protein losing nephropathy. So, how should I approach making a diagnosis? Firstly, you need to take a history, then perform a physical exam, next undertake appropriate laboratory work, and finally undertake appropriate additional tests. Starting with the history and signalment, you need to know the animal's age, as certain conditions are more common in younger or older animals. You need to know the animal's usual diet in order to rule in or rule out inadequate nutrition. You need to know how long the animal has been losing weight for. You need to find out the animal's appetite and demeanour and whether there are any concurrent gastrointestinal signs such as colic, diarrhoea, quidding or dysphagia that might point you in the direction of a particular differential diagnosis. And finally you need to ascertain the animal's worming history so that you can rule in or rule out parasitism such as cyathostomiasis. Having taken your history, you need to move on to a physical examination. Firstly, you need to body condition score the animal. Body condition scoring can either use the 1 to 9 scale or the 1 to 5 scale. In both scales, 1 is extremely underweight and the top end of the scale, so either 9 or 5, is extremely overweight with gradations in between. This will allow you to monitor the response to therapy. You need to determine the temperature, pulse and respiration. For example, peritonitis may be associated with pyrexia. You need to look at the mucous membrane colour, as for example liver disease may be associated with icterus or jaundice. Gut sounds should be auscultated and ventral edema should be looked for. A dental examination should be performed looking for dental disease and finally a rectal palpation performed. Having performed your physical examination, next it is appropriate to undertake laboratory work. Possible tests include a haematology, for example cyathostomiasis is associated with neutrophilia quite often. Biochemistry is essential. Protein losing enteropathies or protein losing nephropathies will be associated with a low total protein concentration and particularly albumin is lost. Liver disease is also associated with reduced albumin production and so hypoalbuminemia. Increased globulins are associated with infectious or inflammatory processes. If there is liver damage, liver enzymes such as SDH, sorbitol dehydrogenase, GGT, gamma glutyl transferase, and ASD, aspartate aminotransferase, will be increased. 
and if there is reduced liver function, the bile acid concentration will be increased. A faecal analysis should be performed looking for parasite eggs. However, this will not give you an indication if you suspect a tapeworm infestation, in which time a serology is more appropriate. And it will also not give you an indication of the cyathostome larval burden. Peritoneal fluid analysis should, should be undertaken in cases of suspected peritonitis. And finally, urine analysis is appropriate if you suspect a protein losing nephropathy and urine protein and specific gravity should be measured. Finally, additional tests may be required. Appropriate tests depend on the individual case, but possibilities include an oral glucose tolerance test. This test involves starving the animal overnight and administering one gram per kilogram of glucose in solution by a nasogastric tube. Blood samples are then taken over the following six hours and blood glucose concentrations measured. In the normal horse, as shown by the blue line, you expect the blood glucose concentration to peak at about 120 minutes and the peak should roughly be a 100% increase on the baseline value. Anything above an 85% increase is considered normal. If there is total malabsorption, as indicated by the red line, blood glucose concentrations will peak at only 15% above the baseline value. This is indicative of significant small intestinal pathology. However, there is a large grey zone between total malabsorption and a normal result. So if the peak blood glucose concentration is anywhere between 15 and 85% increase on the baseline value, this is known as partial malabsorption. And in these cases, the horse may have normal small intestinal function or may have small intestinal pathology. And it is not possible to distinguish between the two and other tests are required. In certain cases, abdominal ultrasonography may be appropriate. All the organs within the abdomen can be examined, including the liver, spleen, kidneys, small intestine, large intestine, stomach and peritoneal cavity. It may be appropriate to perform a biopsy. For example, if you suspect liver disease, then the liver should be biopsied under ultrasound guidance. If you suspect inflammatory bowel disease or alimentary neoplasia, then the duodenum and the rectum can be relatively easily biopsied. The duodenum is biopsied via gastroscopy. The treatment will depend on the underlying cause. For example, dental disease is addressed by rasping, dental extraction, antibiotic therapy for tooth root infections, etc. Liver disease is managed by antibiotics if there is cholangiohepatitis, corticosteroids if there is chronic active hepatitis, or diet if there is ragwort or pyrolizidine alkaloid toxicity. In cases of inflammatory bowel disease, corticosteroid therapy should be tried. Some horses will respond and the disease will resolve completely. Other horses will not improve at all. And finally, there is a third category of cases in which there is a response while the corticosteroid therapy is being administered, but once you try to wean the animals off the steroid therapy, then the signs return. Finally, cyathostomiasis should be treated with either moxidectin or a five-day course of fenbendazole. As far as management is concerned, the response to therapy should be monitored using either the clinical signs, hematology or biochemistry, or ultrasonography if there were ultrasonographic changes. The prognosis depends on the underlying cause. For example, if it was due to inadequate nutrition, then this is easily resolved with owner education and the prognosis is good. Conditions with, with a fair to guarded prognosis include liver disease, peritonitis, cyathostomiasis and inflammatory bowel disease. Conditions with a guarded prognosis include chronic equine glass sickness. And finally, the prognosis in neoplasia is hopeless. So in summary, a wide range of diseases cause weight loss in the horse. A number of further diagnostic tests are often required in order to make a diagnosis. The treatment options vary according to the disease. 
and the prognosis is also variable, ranging from good to hopeless.